Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning. Welcome to the 32nd lecture on economics, management and entrepreneurship. If you recall, we had discussed three functions of management. One was planning, the second was organizing and the third function that we had discussed was controlling. Planning and controlling are like two sides of a coin. One cannot exist without the other. If there is a plan, there has to be a control to ensure that the plan is achieved. To implement a plan, we need to have an organization, the logical grouping of activities and of defining the flow of authority and responsibility. The last function of management which we shall discuss today is directing. Directing consists of a number of sub functions supervising, leading, motivating, communicating and of course coordinating. We shall discuss little elaborately on motivation or how to motivate or the function of motivation or motivating and we shall only give a cursory look at the other sub functions of the directing function of management. So, the topic for today is directing. Directing is the process of issuing instructions and making certain that operations are carried out as originally planned. Usually they are subdivided into five sub functions supervising, leading, motivating, communicating and coordinating. As I said, we shall discuss in great depth on the third sub function that of motivating and the other ones we shall quickly go through. The first is supervising. Supervising is basically to oversee that the subordinates are doing the work. How does it basically work? This function works if proper instructions are available with the supervisor as well as the subordinates as to what is to be done and how it is to be done. Both the product, the output of the workers and the process through which the output will be achieved. If it is a manufacturing process, then the type of type and specification and quantity of raw materials needed, the tools to be used 
and their specifications, the way the setup has to be done on the machine, the feed, speed and depth of cut, all this must be pre-specified. Then both the supervisor and the subordinates, the workers know exactly what is to be done and how it is to be done. The supervisor works to work is to ensure that the things are progressing the way it is planned. It is also the supervisor's responsibility to see whether there are untoward disturbances, machine failures, power cuts, materials not available, tools getting blunt and things of that type. If there are such disturbances, then it is the supervisor's responsibility to report it to the right entity or to the right section or department and to see to ensure that this problem is eliminated, the cause of this problem is eliminated and the work resumes as planned. This is the task of supervision or supervising. Next we look at the leading function. As I told earlier, it is the ability to influence the behavior of a group. It is not same as headship. Headship is the formal authority bestowed upon a person, the power bestowed on an individual to make a decision and to implement the decision. But leadership is much more than headship. It may not be formal. In fact, in informal organization, it is more informal. The natural ability of a person to influence the behavior of others is leadership. It has a connotation that leadership is inborn. However, many have studied the traits of a good leader and certain things have emerged. They are mentioned here in short. An individual is a good leader if he or she supports the activities of the group. By means of support, it does not mean that he supports or he would support the descent of the subordinates. It means that the difficulties that they are facing, the ideas that they are generating to solve a problem, the innovation ability of the workers on the job must be supported by the leader. He must ensure that any idea is properly groomed, idea generated by a subordinate is groomed properly before it is eliminated, before it is said that the idea is useless or worthless. No idea should be discarded as useless or worthless. It must be evaluated in proper spirit, in proper perspective and that is one of the leadership quality, the supportive leadership. Participative leadership, in all activities of the subordinates the superior participates and in all decision making process the group participate. The group participates in deciding what is to be done, 
the group also participates in deciding how the task has to be done. If this participation is there from the subordinates, the task of the superior becomes easy and that is participative management. In all decision making situations, the subordinates must be involved. Later when we will talk about quality control and quality management, we shall also discuss, discuss a Japanese style of quality management which is called quality circle. A quality circle is an informal group where the seniors and the subordinates in particular the workers sit together discuss about the problem the genesis and the root cause of a problem and try to solve them. No opinion is discarded as being bad useless or not applicable that is participative management. Instrumental leadership basically it says about specificity of guidelines, the exact details of how to do, what to do, the quantity, the quality, the tolerance limits must be specified. The tools to be used must be specified in the fullest extent so that there is no ambiguity. These detailed write up on the material, on the process is what is required to carry out a job and a trait of a good leader is to be able to write down these details for the group to understand and follow. And lastly, achievement oriented leadership. Achievement oriented leadership means that the goal is fixed say for example, in a soft floor situation the output the desired output is fixed. So many quantities to be produced in a month or in a week or in a day and if the worker achieves it then he or she is properly rewarded. This is achievement oriented leadership. So, the design of wage incentive plans, the design of reward systems is a part and parcel and a trait of a good leadership. Therefore, leading is very very important. Great leaders have these and other qualities some inborn some designed. We are not going to discuss more on leading this itself is a topic that can take hours for discussion. We are only giving very briefly certain aspects of leadership quality. As I said we shall discuss little in little depth in more depth rather on the function of how to motivate people whether it is leading, whether it is other aspects, whenever there is a group activity, whenever it is required to carry out certain functions so as to achieve the desired goal, motivating group is important, motivating persons in a group is important. Now, how is motivate motivation, how is how are people motivated? Firstly, let us understand that, that unsatisfied need dominates the behavior of a person. That means, if there is a need and that is not satisfied, then any individual will be interested 
to fill that lead, need and therefore, he will be willing to work to see that his need is met. That is unsatisfied need being met and that influences the behavior of an individual and what is motivation? Motivation is defined as a drive that tries to satisfy an existing unsatisfied need. So, motivation is or can be defined as the drive that a person has to try to satisfy an existing unsatisfied need. Therefore, once a need is satisfied, then that is no longer motivating. So, this is the essence of motivation. A person works on the basis of two things. One is his or her innate ability to do the work and the second is his or her willingness to do the work. Ability alone will not result in the desired output, sufficient willingness must be there to do the work. It has been seen time and time again that persons having strong will power and less ability can achieve the results compared to persons with strong ability, but less will power. The will to do is therefore, motivation. We are trying to find out how to bring that will power, how to build that will power in an individual and that is motivation. Motivation can be classified in many ways. One way of classifying motivation is positive or negative. The other way of classifying motivation is whether it is extrinsic or intrinsic. Let us see what is positive motivation. Positive motivation is basically rewarding a person. Praise and reward for the work done by a person that is a positive motivation. Delegate enough authority and responsibility to the individuals he or she will be motivated because he has the power to decide what to do and how much to do and how to do. So, if this, this power rests with the individual, the individual will be highly motivated to do the work. And if the individuals are part and parcel of the decision making process, if it is a participative management participative leadership that also provides positive motivation that increases motivation for the worker. Now, what is negative motivation? Negative motivation is basically punishing just as a reward rewarding a person can improve his or her motivation there are situations where some sort of a punishment can also to some extent motivate a person. Of course, there are strong views for and against whether punishment really motivates <coughs> sorry really motivates the an individual but the fact remains that if there is a fear that somebody would lose job or that lose salary, then that is a motivation, but in a negative way that is negative motivation. Then we have extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation, another way of classifying motivation. Basically, extrinsic motivation is something 
improving the willpower, increasing the willpower of a person to do work because of factors that are extrinsic to him. For example, money is a great motivator for people. Similarly, working conditions can be a great motivator for a person. Air conditioned environment, good illumination can be a great motivator. That's extrinsic motivation that comes from the environment. Then we have intrinsic motivation, motivation that comes from within, a sense of achievement, a sense of accomplishment that I have been able to do something that was assigned to me, that I have done it with great honesty, great care, lot of ability and it has changed the way things were happening earlier is something, a satisfaction that one gets by doing the work and that is accomplishment, self-realization, that is intrinsic, something that comes in the mind of a person because he feels, he or she feels satisfied that he or she has been able to do the work in the best way and that has changed the quality of life that has changed the design of the system, that has changed the work environment. So, this is intrinsic motivation. In this context, let us talk about certain theories of motivation that have been developed in the past. The theories can be grouped under two types, the content theories, the process theories. Content theories basically address the question, what factors motivates people? And process theories address the question, how motivation occurs. Let us spend some time in discussing these theories. First, the content theories in which we shall discuss two theories that are very, very important, the classic Maslow's need hierarchy theory or need hierarchy model and the second is Herzberg's two factor model. Maslow's need hierarchy model is the first to be discussed here and it is classically very, very important contribution to the theory of motivation. As I said, all hierarchies are shown in this manner in a pyramidal structure. Here, an individual's need is defined in five levels. The bottom level needs, the bare minimum needs of any individual are physiological needs, food, clothing and shelter. Most people would like to have these needs satisfied something to eat, something to wear and something somewhere to live, they are physiological needs. Then the needs of safety and security comes, whether the place where we are staying is safe enough, the place where we are working is safe enough, whether the job is secured or not secured, these are security and safety needs. Then comes social needs, whether my friends, my colleagues, they accept me as one of them, that is the social needs. Then a higher level need is the esteem need, self-esteem, 
and the last is self actualization or self realization needs maslow said that unless a lower level all the lower level needs are satisfied no way of motivation can help realize the upper level needs that is to to satisfy an upper level need all the lower level needs must be satisfied that means the design of the motivation motivating system must be such that first the lower level needs must be satisfied we will elaborate on this point further now but first in detail what these needs are psychological needs are uh, sorry this is uh, this should be physiological needs not psychological sorry physiological needs are basic needs of food clothes and shelter it has the highest motivating power and this can be satisfied through good wages incentives and better physical work environments then the next need next higher level need is safety and security needs needs of safety security stability freedom from anxiety danger of losing jobs and how are they satisfied they are satisfied through insurance job security pension schemes and minimum guaranteed wages each of them will be able to satisfy some of the safety and security needs physiological needs through good wage incentives and better physical work environment the still higher level need is the social or the social needs the need for friendship love affection social interaction feeling of belongingness people look for environment where they are understood and accepted and these needs are satisfied through social interaction organized meeting creation of informal groups now look at this whereas physiological and safety and security needs they are satisfied by the design of job design of work environment and design of wage and incentive structures the social needs require involving the individuals in various group meetings social interaction and involving them in the decision making process and so on and so forth that gives a feeling that he is socially also accepted esteem need an urge for achievement prestige status and power self respect is internal recognition this is intrinsic whereas respect from others is external recognition this can be satisfied how if a person is given the task of designing challenging work if his contributions are recognized if he is involved in decision making process if he is sponsored for higher level trainings 
workshops, seminars and symposium. Then the individual will start feeling that he is respected for his ability, for his achievement by the management. So, that is self respect that increases self esteem or self respect and that is a great motivator for many people. And lastly, the self actualization need. This is the need for getting assignment of challenging responsibilities, new product design, managing a new division or a new department, creativity and opportunities for personal growth achievement and achievement. So, these constitute the self actualization need and how they can be satisfied? They can be satisfied by giving the autonomy of shaping jobs, how the how he himself would do the job, he will decide. Having given the full freedom of expression and being able to create, design new way of doing things, new things and new ways of doing things that improves the self actualization, that satisfies the self actualization need of a person. Now, the Maslow's need hierarchy says that first the lower level needs have to be satisfied before the motivating schemes have to be designed for, uh, for satisfying the higher level needs. Now, look at Herzberg's two factor theory. Now, here basically two questions were Herzberg's asked or tried to answer through a questionnaire survey. What is it about the job that an individual likes and what it is, what is it about the job that a person dislikes. Now, here he came up with two sets of answers. The factors related to job satisfaction that answers the first question and factors that are related to job dissatisfaction that answers the second question. First question he calls them motivational factors and the second question he calls hygiene or maintenance factors. Now, first thing the motivational factor is the job itself. The job is itself must give enough satisfaction to the person. Recognition of the person that he is attached to the job. His achievement must be understood and respected. He should have the responsibility of delivering the job and there must be enough potential for growth in the job if the person continues to the job to do the job himself for a long time. Now, these are motivational factors, but there are hygienic or maintenance factors like wages and salaries and benefits, working conditions, interpersonal relations. They, they are required, they are required to maintain the interest of the worker in the job. Basically, these are helpful in satisfying the lower order needs in the Maslow's need hierarchy. But true motivation comes not from money, not from working conditions. Yes, they are motivators, but they only satisfy the basic needs, the three lower level needs in the Maslow's need hierarchy, but the real motivation would come in the motivational factors 
the job must be properly designed must have creativity in built in it and then his achievements must be recognized he should be able to give his contribution to the product and the process and his growth must be ensured now in addition to these two important content theory based models there are process theory based models the brooms expectancy model equality theory and goal setting theory brooms model is that if you do hard work then performance would be good and there must be a reward for this performance then only the person will be motivated and he will put or continue to put hard work so this feedback loop i have not shown but this is understood so work if done well leads to better performance and that must be rewarded equality theory says that there has to be a fair and equitable treatment by the management the management must be very consistent in dealing with giving rewards or punishments to the people for doing or not doing the work as assigned to them and this must be consistently followed that's fair and equitable treatment and that leads to motivating people to do work yet another theory is that if employees participate in setting goals objectives and in planning then it also motivates people to do work now there are different theories of motivation and the basic maslow's need hierarchy continues to stand tall among them because it says any reward scheme must first of all look at the lower level needs of an individual the physiological needs the security needs and the social needs if they are satisfied and they can be satisfied mostly through work environments design of better work environment paying good incentive schemes and things of that type but more importantly the employees must be part and parcel of the decision making process with regard to the design of the product with regard to the design of the process and then he must have enough opportunities for showing the creativity or his creativity in the product or process design and that helps an ind individual to gain self respect or satisfy the need for self respect and also feel fully satisfied in terms of self actualization then the main learning from this motivation theories are like this that main condition for motivation is employees must enjoy doing the work job satisfaction leads to higher productivity job dissatisfaction leads to high absenteeism high turnover employee unrest quality and schedule problems management therefore must provide both good working conditions and good wage and salary structures and involve employees in decision making in this context we can discuss two other approaches for motivation one is job enlargement and the other is job enrichment job enlargement is a process in which a person is assigned more than one task when a person does the same task again and again he gets tired loses interest doesn't find any avenue for injecting creativity 
So, sometimes what is done more work is assigned to the person, so that he is not tired, he is not bored doing the same work over and over again, he does something else. So, he switches from one task to another, from one job to another. This is job enlargement. It is often seen that job enlargement helps a person to improve his productivity. However, there are opponents of this view, they feel that instead of enlarging the scope of a person's activities in terms of giving more job, it is better if he is her, her one uh, or job, his or her job content is enriched. Meaning that not only the person knows what to do, the person decides what to do, the person decides how to do the job, the person decides whom to engage in doing the job. If these freedoms or autonomy or power is given to an individual to do the job, the same job, only one job not enlarging it, but the decision making process involved in the design of the product and the process for the job is done by him, then that is that is job enrichment. It has been seen that job enrichment is a very, very important motivating factor in industries. Next, we talk about communicating is the means by which people are linked together. And usually when we talk about communicating, we talk about communication process. And here we normally go into theory of communication that says that there is a source who sends the communication and there is a final sync, the receiver of the communication. The sender is the source and the receiver receives the communication. But how is this communication sent? First of all, what is communicated is encoded. It could be a signal, it could be a, a written document, it could be a computer mail, it could be a telephonic conversation. So, first of all there is an encoding of the message and then it goes through a channel. The channel could be a mail through a telecom or an email device, it could be a postal device, it could be by locker, it could be by a person. So, there is a channel and then it is decoded. Decoded is understanding what is written and then finally, the receiver looks at it. Now, these are the various elements in a communication process. Let us understand that there are different problems associated in the communication process. One is the noise component that invariably comes. Something is put in a document and the document some letters are missing or the document is torn and not available. A page of the whole document is not received by the receiver. In fact, while encoding also there can be problem. Suppose that a table of figures or numerical figures are to be put in, we can always make mistakes and that is an error. It goes through the channel, gets received, the receiver does not understand it. Of course, finally, there is another problem when the receiver receives the document, he is unable to understand what the message says. 
that is the semantic problem. He does not understand what was intended in the first place by the sender to be conveyed to him in the form of a message. This is the semantic problem associated with communication. Thus, there are noise problems and there are semantic problems and also at the time of encoding there is a problem that the true message is not properly encoded. So, these are also true not for electronic communication messages, but also in organizations and proper means proper redundancy must be designed. So, that the semantic problems, the noise problems, the unintentional encoding problems are not there. When I say redundancy, it means that a document may go and at the same time a telephonic message may also go to the person. This is a redundant flow of communication, but it helps in improving the reliability of the communication process. Types of communication could be oral, could be written or non-verbal. Non-verbal communication is gaining importance in social, social systems. The postures, a person who is angry looks different, a person who is not satisfied looks different. So, the very look can make a lot of meaning to persons uh, before, before him and there are similar such non-verbal communicating devices, non-verbal devices. Forms of communication, normally communications flow from top to bottom in the form of plans being written down and sent to plans and schedules are sent to the bottom level managers and to the workers. Instructions, guidelines, procedures, steps, so they are all passed down vertically downwards, but at the same time there is a vertically upward flow of communication as well in the form of reports, appraisal reports, progress reports, implementation reports, they all flow upwards, exception reports they all flow upwards for the top management to get to know what is being done, whether there are shortfalls, variance reports and similar such things. Then horizontal flow, as I told you there are functional divisions of work between marketing and production. So, there are also flows of marketing people say I need this many quantities of products at the end of December. This information is passed on to the production department. Production department passes on information about how much raw materials to procure to the purchase department. Purchase department buys it and the revenue requirement, I am sorry the cash requirement is decided by the finance department. So, you can see that there is a horizontal flow of information as well. And lastly, there is a network relationship or communication in which one department head can give copies to other departments people also not necessarily uh, only his own people top or bottom, his own subordinates or superiors not just to other functional managers to others as well. This is network communication. I have already discussed about communication problems. Two more things that I would like to talk about here is the scarcity in information and information overload. As you know decisions are taken on the basis of information. If information is scarce, good decisions may not be taken. 
at the same time if one is overloaded with a lot of information then also a person receiving that information may not be able to know which information is important and which is not and therefore taking a good decision is not always expected from a person who is having lot of information than what he requires lastly we talk about coordination or coordinating coordinating is basically the orderly management of a group function it both requires collective effort and synchronization of effort basically the directing function requires writing down what is to be done and then somebody to supervise lead motivate and finally to ensure that the activities done by the group members are done in a coherent fashion in a synchronized fashion as per schedule so that the job is fully done for that it it is required that people meet together in group meetings in seminars both formal and informal meetings and with the help of these formal and informal group meetings it's possible to see that the work being done by members of the group are done in a coherent and synchronized fashion so friends we have taken 4 hours or rather 5 hours to talk about the basic principles of management and the functions of management the generic functions of management now what we intend to do in our next class is to go into next classes is to go into the detailed functional management systems to start with we shall take the case of product management and then we will talk about various other functional managements like manufacturing marketing and so on and so forth thank you for today